and that through uh, cooperation and collective uh, agreement we would all uh, benefit. In sum, this was meant to uh, provide lasting stability and security for all and that this could only be achieved through collective and collaborative uh, security in all three dimensions with full uh, uh, respect for fundamental freedoms and human rights uh, for all citizens in our region. Today, some would say that the era of international liberal democracy is over. With increased um, divisions, both within and between societies, how did we get here? Is it the issues that have become more divisive, or is it the way that we have been dealing with them? Is it more about the economy or culture that has changed? Is it about bread or circus? Is it more about nostalgia for the past or fear for the future? And when we see popular support for populist solutions, how much of this is driven by demand and how much by supply? Finally, are we therefore entering an era of more tyranny of majority at the national level and the tyranny of minority at the collective level where one or a few uh, uh, block the will uh, of the majority? I'm very pleased um, that I have with me today uh, a very distinguished and also very diverse uh, panel of speakers to help us discuss these uh, issues. Uh, both how we arrived to where we uh, are at the both at the, and, and the, the, um, uh, the interrelated relations between the national and the international uh, level, but more importantly also what could or indeed should be done. Uh, to counter fragmentation and divisions in the OSCE region. To my right, I'm pleased to have with me a member of the European Parliament, Mr. Tomasz Stechowski, got that right. Uh, then I have, as many would know, uh, Ambassador Claude Wild, permanent representative of Switzerland to the OSCE. To my left, I have uh, Magdalena Grono from the International Crisis Group. And last but not least, I'm also pleased to have Mr. Dejan Bojanic, the Vice President of the European Youth Forum. And given your diverse and rich backgrounds, your experience and expertise, let us start with um, sharing your thoughts on the same question from your respective uh, perspective. And starting with uh, Mr. Tomasz, uh, I would like to, uh, you to share with us what do you see as the most significant issues and or drivers uh, that polarize society both within and among uh, societies and then briefly some uh, uh, first thoughts about how we can address this. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and gentlemen uh, this, uh, this, uh, dear guest, I'm very happy that I want to be with you and we want to speak about the uh, issue of security. This is one of my issues, what is discussed now in the European uh, Parliament. You know that uh, European Parliament and European budget was not for many years interesting about security because security was something what was not so important for many countries. I uh, speak about internal security because it was something what was internal for every member states. But uh, if we see the growing tension between countries and uh, in the societies, we are speaking about uh, about role of organization as uh, OESC and uh, another organization as is United Nations, NATO and others would have very important role in a European environment. 
Unfortunately, that's, uh, this is also means that these societies are more divided and polarized too. We, will, uh, we want to see how many states are reacted for, uh, for the election and how they prepare the crisis plan. Today was, uh, was really most important, uh, most important message from, from France that it was pre prepared some crisis pl um, plan as the reaction for winning one of the candidate of the election. And you can see that many st stabilized and very old democratic countries as France or as uh, Germany, as Great Britain, are um, now reacting on the situation in the society. Most OSCE countries are facing the same complex problem. And as an MEPs, I'd like to focus primarily on Europe and single European state. Simple solution offered by populists are almost always uh, the best and, applic uh, and uh, applicable or some worse. All non-populist uh, politicians must be therefore able to reflect this problem and equivalent react. Many years ago was really the, the topic of um, immigration was something what was not so open discuss it. We want to see a situation in many countries. If I visit uh, or if we speak uh, in European Parliament about problems with immigration, this is still about uh, self-correction, what we want to say about this issue and about these problems. We have a lot of troubles. We want to discuss the, the issue of um, many member states what have the problem of the security. But I think that nobody wants to openly bring these problems to European uh, Union and want to discuss that there these problems exist. For example, the color and problem with color. This is not problem only between two countries. This is not problem only between the France and between Great Britain. But this is still problem of all of Europe because United Kingdom is key to the innovation. It's key state for many countries as export and import country. When we talking about any politician decision, of course, there will always be some disputes, controversial, and div dividing issue. We, if we are speaking about, uh, about the countries in European Union, there are many, many countries who has problem with democratic approach. Nevertheless, the job of responsible politicians in democratic societies is to help the conflict, to find a dialogue, to find any solution, to find, uh, find a way how we want to discuss more about, uh, about this problematic issue. And one of them is um, to be really open uh, this dialogue without uh, any stamps to say before he's populist, he's non-populist, but bring these people to the one table. I think that uh, if we speak about the situation in European Union, there is very important the claims. Uniting unity in the necessary things, liberty in doubtful things, charity in all things. In order of words, uh, there shows be much as possible unity in necessary things and liberty in uh, double uh, disputable issue. After all, united in diversity. The motto of European Union, bear a response uh, uh, resemblance to quote which 
I've mentioned, the European Union is prepared to bring much more stability to the world. And uh, we know that uh, at the borders, don't start our security. The security of the Europe start in, in this moment in Syria, in Libya, in, in Sudan and in other countries. Also, I see that uh, European Union want to do maximum for stability in Africa, for stability in Middle East, and for stability in Asia and other countries. Also, this is my first message to you, and I'm prepared here to discuss with you this issue. Thank you very much, Thomas, and I would like to, to hand over the floor to Claude. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm the Perm Rep of Switzerland, of course, but here I'm more re representing diplomacy. Um, I've been asked to try to formulate what uh, diplomats who are agents of government shaping international relations, as well as the tools and processes used in it, can contribute to counter fragmentation within and between societies. Let me maybe start with my own definition of what is social fragmentation. I would say that social fragmentation occurs when social diversity turns into social division. Uh, in Europe, we have recently observed such a process in several countries when on top of some weaknesses of social engineering in a given society, there was an inability of the national establishment and of the international community to cope with societal problems induced by global challenges such as migration, phenomenon, economic and financial crisis, terrorism, or climate change. Now, how does this fragmentation express itself? Fear-mongering, rejection of traditional establishment, rise of identitarism, as we say in French. This happens when in society, large parts of the population replace an attitude of sound patriotism, which is open to others, with vindicative nationalism, confronting the others. There, that, that is wh where the vicious circle, which you have described in your paper, starts. Um, internal fragmentation then becomes or can become a threat to rule of law and to protection of minorities. Internationally, societies that have moved so, so far will then become catalysts of the fragmentation of the international community, which then empowers chaos over cohesion and add risks of confrontation over cooperation. So we see fully the circle, internal fragmentation leading to international fragmentation, which then leads again to internal fragmentation. So what are the solution uh, to go out of this vicious circle, um, seen again from what the diplomatic community can do? Um, faced with global challenge again, we should not just speak about shared responsibility and common action. We should actually implement it. And implement it through innovative mechanisms of international and inclusive governance. What do I mean by inclusive? It means facing real world problems with responses that are shaped by real-world actors. And real-world actors are more 
than just the intergovernmental actors, the diplomats or the governments. It is very much also the corporate actors and of course the civil society actors. The real world, and this should be put into 21st, uh, diplomacy, 21st century diplomacy, is much larger than just uh, to be left to inter intergovernmental actors. Responses uh, to global challenges that are shaped commonly by the three pillars of the real world have the best chances to be holistic and sustainable in the real world. This is then a plea for a diplomacy to create more multi-stakeholder initiatives. There's also a plea for a multi-dimensional approach of global challenges. Take the phenomenon, for example, of large movement of migrants and refugees. If you want to, to have a responsible governance of this uh, phenomenon, you must be able to simultaneously and internationally coordinated address at least five major issues that are linked to the phenomenon. Protection of the migrants on the road, border management in a harmonized and humanized way, combating crime, which goes along the, ro the road of migration, smuggling, trafficking, uh, etc., all the organized crime uh, activities that profits from this um, uh, poor people on the road. Guarantees for successful integration for the migrants we accept to integrate, not just to park them in our societies, in de facto ghettos, but to really integrate them. Otherwise, we create the next step of fragmentation. And fifth, you must also uh, act in solidarity and partnership with the countries that are the frontline states of this phenomenon. Because if they are not able to cope more, then uh, we ha have an even bigger security crisis. So if we are not able to do this, we create a security crisis out of a manageable phenomenon of displacement, like we had on the Balkan route in 2015. And this security crisis of 2015 induced a lot of fragmentation in European societies, even in societies that haven't seen one single migrant because, of course, of the recuperation of this phenomenon. So this is a job for 21st century diplomacy uh, to shape uh, diplomacy along this line, having multidimensional answers, multi-stakeholder processes, flexible and inc inclusive initiatives. As we see ourselves in the OSCE, which is blocked in its formal settings, informality is often more productive than formality. That is why, for example, our uh, structured dialogue, which comes out of a formal decision, is is, is run in an informal working group, simply because we are able to be more uh, addressing the problem than when we have to be in the corset of formality. Um, so I also would like to say that soft law guidance is often more rapid to have an agreement than long negotiated international conventions which at the end are not applied. Uh, and so, uh, an example is the UN Guidelines on Business and Human Rights, which was created in the United Nations by a Harvard professor, John Ruggie, and who managed to have a consensus between governments, corporations, and civil society. This should be uh, a way to follow. My last point would be on communication against fragmentation because politics is based more on perception than on facts. We also have to show more clearly what is the cost of fragmentation induced by populism. Um, we have to show clearly that 
this fragmentation is a liability to our security. Uh, and it's not a response for more security. It's a liability. It must be clear that security is also more than defense. We heard this morning from our host the importance of investing in defense, absolutely, but security is more than defense. Social engineering is security. Uh, governance of migration phenomenon is security. Development cooperation in our periphery is security. Prevention of violent extremism and radicalization is security. Economic connectivity is security. And these things cost less than uh, uh, defense programs, which are necessary. But often we are not clear about uh, security. We should communicate better. And here's the OSCE who for, a long, for decades now works in comprehensive security could be at the forefront of, of this. So, um, my plea is that uh, more should be invested in the non-military part of the production of security and uh, that defense spending alone will have no effect, unfortunately, on societal fragmentation, which is today in Europe a real threat to our global security. I'll end with that. Thanks a lot, and uh, I think you, you touched upon one of the dilemmas that when we're trying to dis uh, distinguish between perception and fact, of course, perceptions tend to be political facts for those who are holding them. Uh, let me now pass on to, to Magdalena and, and perception from, from your side. Thank you very much. Um, a great pleasure to be here. Um, of course, the previous speakers have made it clear that we have a whole fan of iterations of fragmentation to choose from. We have fragmentation that relates to conflict, fragmentation that um, relates to uh, still post-Cold War transitions in some parts of Europe, but in other parts of Europe to uh, the sort of new rise of nationalism, nativism, and even fringe ideologies and a breakdown of political system. And I think that, uh, and indeed to uh, insufficient uh, integration, et cetera, and I think that, uh, for me, uh, a very important point is that these processes are, of course, going on in parallel, and they stress the international system because they, of course, take up a lot of bandwidth uh, within each of these the actors in which they are taking place. And this um, makes a lot of the current ongoing realignment very difficult, um, and, and indeed there's a lot of flux and fluidity. And that, in turn, indeed impacts on the ability of the international system to affect conflict, uh, to, excuse me, to address conflict and to deal with the traditional challenges. Now, I have chosen uh, the theme of conflict uh, to focus on as uh, possibly the most, uh, indeed, it's the most violent uh, manifestation of the divides that exist. Uh, of course, the OSC is also uh, one of the best placed actors to uh, address the fragmentation created uh, by conflict. We, as uh, International Crisis Group, focus on uh, field-based analysis of conflict. So I felt this, was, uh, this would have been a good fit. But I also think um, that very often in discussions about big picture security challenges in Europe, it is quite difficult to link that big picture discussion with indeed uh, what is happening on the ground and how conflict is affecting the lives of people and how this is playing out for them. Uh, and I think that uh, the previous panel made uh, an extremely important point that the countries so-called in between, and I in fact don't like the term in between, but uh, th that those countries should not be objects, they should be subjects. I think I would like to take that point even further and say their societies need to be um, uh, subjects because those are the societies that will ultimately have to own any peace deal, uh, any settlement, and those are the societies that will ultimately have to uh, live side by side after the, the conflict divides are healed. So uh, I will start with probably a very self-evident point, uh, and uh, forgive me the self-evidence, but I think it's important to dwell on it. The fragmentation is indeed manifested, uh, for one, by physical divides. Now, uh, of course, uh, these divides uh, are, they come in different shape and forms, but those are the divides that uh, impact on the life of people by displacement, by indeed people having to deal with sheer violence, uh, by uh, having to deal with loss and trauma of conflict. 
uh, and, and, and these divides uh, exist. They come, as I said, in different iterations. Uh, for instance, the Karabakh conflict uh, is one where we have the most militarized uh, line of contact in, on the continent. Uh, it is a divide across which there has been extremely little communication for the past uh, over 20 years. It is a divide that keeps the societies entirely separate from an one another. And it is also a divide that um, sees these societies uh, develop with uh, so little knowledge of each other's concerns and of each other's, uh, indeed, um, interests that it is something that uh, is making the conflict very risky. It is also uh, making the conflict increasingly, uh, in a sense, intractable. People, new generations have grown up who have not seen uh, a representative of the other side. And those are people who do not uh, have a, 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 a face to name. So for those people, of course, uh, war is on the one hand more abstract, but on the other hand, they, uh, it is possibly less costly. Now, second um, example of those uh, physical divides, of course, uh, is, uh, are the divides that are more porous across which we see uh, a lot more um, interchange. Um, but even those divides, like in eastern Ukraine or like, for instance, in Georgia, Abkhazia, of course, on much lesser scales, those are divides that come with uh, great cost to those involved. Uh, getting across that divide uh, is, A, for one thing, a very difficult thing, but B, uh, the more difficult thing is probably the split in people's loyalties, the split in uh, people's identities that come with these divides. Uh, the more difficult thing is that in order to get the permission to get across the divide, you probably have to pay a bribe, uh, stand in a very long queue, and you probably have to be interviewed by security services on either of the sides. So these are very strong costs that uh, people incur, and that, of course, then again feed into into the fragmentation. Um, I think uh, the other point I would like to make is about the divergent narratives. The divergent narratives, I mean, we've heard a lot, and I think that was extremely good and extremely helpful, uh, but we've heard a lot about the big uh, east-west divergent narrative. But I would like to say that across the OSCE area, of course, we then have sub-iterations of divergent narratives that relate to each specific conflict situation. And those are the narratives that will also ultimately have to be dealt with as we uh, somehow strive to uh, reconciliation. I think that the previous two panels uh, talked about the divergent positions of sides, be it in Ukraine, be it indeed in, in, uh, in Georgia, but also in uh, the Karabakh conflict. Uh, they also mentioned the notion of divergent interpretations of what these conflicts are about. And I think this is extremely important because we see that these conflicts are playing at different levels. You have the east-west level, but you also have the more regional and more local levels. And each of the parties uh, interprets these conflicts through a different prism. So indeed, uh, this is again what uh, puts much more stress on the effort to find solutions, because as uh, you have these sort of asymmetric threat perceptions, it is very difficult to be uh, more open to local level solutions if at the same time you are feeling threatened uh, in the more geostrategic space. And I think this is something that is uh, also well worth reflecting um, uh, on, and I liked uh, the previous panel's recommendation to work really at the sort of uh, iterative steps at, uh, uh, I think it was a notion of a cobweb of opportunities. I would say yes, absolutely, but that needs to be done at these different levels of conflict. Uh, I think it needs to be done in the bigger um, east-west confrontation, but I think it also needs to be done at the local level of the conflict where indeed opportunities can emerge. And this is where the narratives become very difficult because uh, the, the sort of conflict narratives uh, of each of the conflicting sides uh, given the divergence of positions um, and of interpretations, they become a sort of truth. Yeah? And in order to stick to that truth, suddenly creativity is very much limited. You see that these uh, narratives play out in internal discourses of each of the societies. You see that they play out in 
uh, the fights between position and opposition. We see that in a number of the countries, in the more open societies. Uh, we then see that in the more closed societies, the conflict narratives are often used to sort of uh, perhaps rally uh, the national support uh, behind leaders who might otherwise have more pressing uh, questions to answer from the society. So I think uh, this perhaps um, is enough on the narratives, although I'd be very happy to develop on this uh, further in the discussion. But I would like to say one more thing that relates to yesterday's discussion on the social media. It was a very interesting discussion, and I think uh, there's a lot of debate on if and how social media play a role, a positive role and negative role also in relation to these conflicts. I would say, of course, the social media play a very important role. Uh, but I would say that uh, at some level it is a reflection of what is otherwise going on in these societies. So where you have a little more opening and a little more of a dialogue, say, at a civil society level, you can also expect that there will be uh, some interaction in Facebook, contact, you know, you will see that the, these links exist. Where, however, there is very little contact and very little space for any kind of, say, track two initiatives or any kind of uh, outreach across the conflict divide, indeed, social media are almost invariably used to really cement the positions, and they are very often used in a very vicious way for propaganda, they are uh, used in a self-referential circle of, of people who then um, really do not see necessarily space for compromise. I think uh, you asked us to deal with the uh, solutions later, so I will stop here. Yeah. I think, I think you already touched, of course, of some of them by describing the problems, um, uh, but, but let's get back to that uh, in, in the next round. And then, last but not least, I'm, I'm very pleased to have also the perspective of the, uh, of the European Youth Forum. And, and Dejan, please, you have yes, the floor. Thank you very much. And I can, just, I can try to pick up where you left off a little bit. Um, just uh, to begin with, maybe I just uh, to explain the perspective I come from. So I'm Vice President of the European Youth Forum. Uh, has any of you ever heard of a European Youth Forum? There's a few, so we are, in, in kind of in, in, in a sentence, we are an association of youth platforms in Europe. Uh, so association of youth organizations, which are also associations themselves, and we got 103 members from across Europe, which then combine to represent uh, 80 million young people from the continent. Uh, and of course, everything that you've already mentioned before, uh, I mean, it, it equally kind of applies to young people as anyone else in society. So then I'm gonna try to use my uh, six, seven, eight minutes uh, to maybe mention some, some parts which um, haven't been mentioned before about how or like where do we as young people experience uh, polarization. Uh, I'll try to focus then how we experience it in uh, cyberspace. Uh, I'll try to focus uh, on how we experience it uh, when there are conflicts between states or between regions and then also how we experience it when there is a divide within a society. Uh, so when it comes to the cyber domain, I mean, a lot of interactions now for young people, anyone, happens online and happens on social media, uh, which was where you kind of uh, left your intervention. Uh, and what happens that there's one characteristic of social media which is very important to think about when we have this discussion, and that characteristic is that social media is bias in its nature. Uh, what, what I mean by that is that when you, you know, if you want to join, if I want to join Twitter today, uh, you know, I might think that I'm joining a neutral space where I can connect with a lot of people from around the world, but in fact, social media is a service which functions on, on the kind of the fact that, you know, uh, the, the consumer is given what they want to read and what they want to see and hear. So if I join now uh, Twitter, and I'm probably going to, you know, follow OSCE and the Secretary in General, Zanier, and I'll, I'll probably kind of get recommendations to follow other organizations working with uh, security, working with the cooperation, working with peace. And before I know it, I will kind of, the more I engage, the more I'll be fed with the content that I want to see there. So what happens then is that I'll create a bubble where I'm constantly kind of surrounded with the opinions and ideologies that I support myself. And the first time I come across another account which comes from a different bubble, that's where another characteristic of social media comes in, which is its anonymous nature. Because of then anonymity, uh, and because you know there are kind of people from two different bubbles coming across each other, then there is all of a sudden a lot of violence, a lot of bullying, a lot of abuse, 
uh, there is a kind of the, the communication which would have not normally happened if it was in real life. But because it's anonymous, because on social media, uh, there is then a lot of kind of uh, really abusive uh, interactions between people, which then just extends the, the polarization which was already in place. Uh, so that is kind of one space where we, where we feel a, a big divide. And of course, that also only happens if, if uh, a country allows or if, when uh, social media is not censored or forbidden. Uh, another, another thing is uh, a, when, when there is a conflict between two states or between uh, regions, uh, I think that it was already this whole morning uh, there was a lot of discussion about what are the effects on, on people, including on young people. Uh, but what I want to kind of bring in is that in globalized world, uh, division don't always happen only between two different or more states or regions, but also between kind of states and whole segments of society. Um, so for example, the, the example that I want to bring out, and I'm not going to use the states, but I'm going to tell you what happened uh, in the European Youth Forum, in, in my organization. Uh, we had recently a, a council of members uh, where 103 of our member organizations came together, and normally it's a place for kind of collaboration, but that was uh, one of the rare times where there were uh, representatives from our member from Russia, National Youth Council in Russia, and representatives uh, of uh, LGBTQ youth organizations. So IGLIO is the International Federation of LGBTQ Young Students and, and Young People. Um, and what happened is that throughout the whole kind of course of our Council of Members, there's been a lot of conflict and attempts of negotiations uh, about kind of how can these two sides come together uh, about the reports from, from uh, some media, later confirmed by other media and other civil society organizations. Uh, about what is effect, in effect the genocide against gay and bisexual men in the Chechenian Republic of the Russian Federation. Uh, so this kind of conflict between a whole segment of society between the LGBTQ population and the, the Chechenian Republic has affected a lot also how we in a civil society and how youth organizations interact with each other. Uh, and I mean later I can tell you kind of how this, this how was this resolved, how was this conflict and how was this kind of polarization uh, uh, result under the umbrella of the European Youth Forum. Uh, and then the final kind of um, uh, space or aspect uh, of polarization that we experience as young people is within society. Uh, they say that uh, my generation, uh, the generation Y and millennials, both, uh, uh, both of those, they say that we are a movement in itself. So just by being a young now means being a movement because, because of the kind of circumstances in which we are brought up. Uh, because of you know the, 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 the economic crisis and the austerity measures uh, 2007 and later um, we have kind of you know we kind of were up brought in a different world and we have completely different ways of thinking and what happened is that those ways of thinking those ideologies do not really get reflected in policy making at all and that only extends the polarization. So what happens is that most governments don't have any mechanism for structural input. Not that, you know, governments of course would have like young employees and, and, and maybe young ministers, but there is a rarely structured mechanism through which young people, through youth organizations, can be represented in policy making. So the only way for us to kind of represent our way of thinking of how society should work is through voting. But what happened also with voting in a couple of last uh, elections and results is that um, you know, young people indeed have radically different opinions than other age groups, but then those opinions don't get reflected in the final results. Uh, one of the examples of that is uh, a referendum on uh, Brexit. So according to the polling data from YouGov, 75% of 18 to 24 year olds voted to remain in the European Union. So when you have 75% of young people wanting to remain and then have to live with the consequences of leaving the European Union, there is obviously a lot of anger and frustration. There's even a bigger polarization. Similar in the US, 37% um, of people uh, voted for the current president of the USA. So majority of young people kind of tried to express their way of thinking of how society should be governed, but that was not reflected in the final results. And that is kind of then frustration with which young people have to live in a society. Uh, in addition to this kind of political and, and, and uh, economic uh, dimension of sustainable development, if you like, uh, economically also there is a big divide between young people and other age groups. Uh, youth unemployment have never been uh, higher. Um, I'm going to read out some 57.9% of youth unemployment in Spain, 57.5% in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 
53.3 in Greece, so it's a lot of countries, every other young person is unemployed, and these rates are much higher than for other age groups in society, and these don't just happen by chance, it also happens because of a structural discrimination against young people. There are still European countries which have minimum youth wage, which is lower than a minimum wage, uh, there is, you know, there is uh, kind of the way the job market works right now is that what used to be entry-level jobs, entry-level jobs are now unpaid internships. There is a lack of kind of access uh, of young people to social security systems, and because of that, we then end up uh, on these high rates of unemployment. We then just again kind of uh, accumulate more and more frustration and makes the divide even larger. Uh, and because I already mentioned kind of social and economic, I just want to have briefly mention of the kind of environmental dimension of sustainable development. Because also on our environmental issues, it was also young people through youth organizations that have led kind of very progressive movement on tackling climate change and other environmental issues. But that hasn't been really followed up by political leadership, uh, which again has caused even bigger divide between generations within each and every society in in uh, OSCE region. Uh, so I'm going to leave you with that to think about kind of where, how we experience the, the divide and, and maybe the final thought is um, that uh, I think it was last week that the European Broadcasting Unions uh, did a research, Generation What, maybe you've heard of the Generation What research, uh, and one of, the, one of the, the results were that 54% of young people, so majority of young people between ages of uh, 18 and 34, said that they would take part in a large-scale uprising against the generation in power if it would happen the next day or the next month. So this is the level of frustration that we've accumulated because of the divide, because of kind of where we are, and because of how difficult it is to express our way of how a society should be governed and function. Thanks a lot, Dan. Um, let me quickly take a, a round, maybe, and, and I'll continue with you and, and okay. make the round uh, back. And I picked up on, on what you mentioned. You, you used the example from, from the Brexit uh, yeah. vote, where, uh, where the young were among, uh, had the, the, among the, the highest demonstrated wish to remain uh, in yeah. uh, the European Union. But at the same time, also, many of them uh, remained at home. Basically, they also didn't go to vote that day. And how would you square what we see in a number of, of, uh, of countries uh, on the one hand, increasing um, apathy mm. uh, or distrust in the political leadership of representing youth, mm. while youth participation in the formal processes remain low and uh, youth participation through uh, uh, membership in political parties uh, even lower. Uh, what do you think we can, uh, what should or could be done in order mm. to address that and how much of that would have to come from youth itself and how much would have to then come from these institutions to making sure that the, uh, the voice and the interest of uh, uh, the new generations of voters are indeed taken into consideration. Uh, yeah, I understand that this is considered somehow kind of on, a, on just a, on a quick, on a first look it looks like uh, apathy. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's apathy. I think that that also uh, means that, you know, the way we understand democracy doesn't really successfully uh, kind of takes in inputs of young people uh, because young people are active if not on voting there we are active in a lot of other different ways so there's there are so many young people active through uh, youth organizations I don't know how many of uh, adults here your you know spouses your parents uh, are active in civil society organizations because a lot of young people are young people kind of lead a lot of online petitions there's a lot of people who young people who don't know how else to express themselves but through protests on the streets uh, and this is not also just kind of like uh, experience from, from uh, me and from, from European Youth Forum. Uh, I looked up that uh, there was recently, I think maybe two or three years ago, uh, OSCE uh, Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. They made a report about youth in political participation processes and they also make the same analysis that young people are active. Uh, it's just that uh, they kind of haven't been able to fully express their activism through voting. And a part of that is also that voting has been quite um, kind of difficult to, or just participation in those formal uh, political processes has been quite difficult for young people. Um, you know, for example, uh, there is, 
yeah, recently Macron was elected for president of France, but in so many countries, like in Germany, Lithuania, Italy, Turkey, Estonia, he would never be able to become a president because there's a lab la age limit to 40, and he's 39 years old. In a lot of other European countries, age limit is 35. So we are kind of from, from young age kind of learned to believe that politics and voting is something that is out there for some adults who can have the right to, to run, to put themselves out for elections. Uh, so that is one thing that I think that kind of the way system works is that if we are told that this is not for us And then how do you expect us to come on on polling stations also kind of it doesn't really fully reflect the way young people now Communicate and work there's you know in a lot of countries you need to I don't know register for vote a lot of young people live abroad There's no possibility of voting online uh, and, and kind of overall I think that the, 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 the voting is almost kind of meant to not fully work in line with how young people see political participation. Thanks a lot. Let me then turn to, to Magdalena. Uh, you mentioned uh, in, uh, in your intervention the importance of looking at the community level when it comes to addressing fragmentation and division, as well as how both deep division can lead to conflict and the same as um, conflicts can maintain uh, division also outside, of course, the, the direct uh, conflict area. Um, in, uh, as the crisis group, all those I'm sure most here are familiar with your report, with your assessments and the recommendation to the different stakeholders. I'd, I'd like you to, to develop a bit more on uh, starting with that community perspective and to, to, uh, to approach uh, them as sub uh, subjects, those who are directly affected. Um, more specifically, who do you think in this more and more interdependent world, both on the international, national, local and even online level, who do you see currently uh, as the best place to effectively address and counter uh, these trends, in particular in relation then to conflict settings? Mm -hmm. So look, my uh, point was that I think that uh, the solutions to the conflict in uh, the Eastern Partnership countries will have to come at, you know, they will have to uh, address the broader geostrategic standoff as well as indeed the regional and the very intensely local uh, levels of conflict. Now, I agree with uh, whoever on the previous panel, s uh, panel said it, that there is very unlikely to be any kind of big time breakthrough uh, on the uh, big picture level uh, anytime soon. Therefore, I do believe that the fora that exist for conflict settlement right now are important in the sense of managing these conflicts. I think that uh, that's why they indeed uh, need to be supported and in that with divergence in different conflicts in different ways, they've been more or less successful. I do believe that uh, they have been able to address some of the local level issues with uh, huge respect and a lot of affection to Madame Panjikidze. I do uh, not necessarily agree that the biggest achievement of the Geneva talks was to agree on uh, the next round of the talks. I think that especially at the humanitarian level there has been some progress, there has been a possibility to deal with med medical emergency evacuations, there's been possibilities to deal with issues of missing persons, uh, am among others thanks to, to that forum. There's been uh, possibilities to address some uh, issues of, of education of children, etc., of uh, possibly facilitate crossings, etc. So yes, these are small steps. Uh, but I think that given the bigger picture sort of freeze, I think that it's very unlikely to expect much more. Now, in terms of uh, still uh, the local level of conflicts, I think uh, that it is important uh, that there's an effort to reach out to people living in the conflict regions. I realize this is intensely linked with status questions. This is why it is so difficult, because uh, there is always a risk that by engaging apolitical actors, and here I stress apolitical because of course uh, engaging uh, de facto authorities in this or that region uh, is something that uh, the uh, sort of metropolitan state would find untenable and for very good reasons. But in a political context, I think that there is a lot of merit. There has been uh, some progress towards that, uh, but I think that uh, leaving, uh, you know, a lot of the concerns of these people unaddressed is a very big problem. 
I would like to say a couple, if I may, moving on from what your question, I would, move, I would like to say a couple more things. I think it is important, especially in addressing the local level issues, to indeed be quite pragmatic and to try and create some positive dynamism in these conflicts. I think that that is precisely done by moving beyond the narratives and looking indeed at interests and needs of, of the people. I very much like the notion of islands of change. It came up uh, yesterday, uh, it is coming up more and more in Vienna. I think that it is a very powerful notion. I first came across it in Ukraine uh, by civil society organizations that were trying to sort of galvanize reform efforts and I thought, yes, this is indeed uh, the, the right logic. Now I would say that as we're exploring the islands, uh, these new islands to which to travel, we need to be painfully aware of our past travels, of our experience with uh, uh, traveling from the past. So I think that it is important to really identify those islands that can have some traction. Why I'm saying this is that I think, for instance, that uh, the notion that the conflict settlement fora uh, for these conflicts can be an island of change, I almost think that this is uh, something that doesn't necessarily lend itself to uh, being a credible interpretation of these islands, because we have a lot of fora that have existed for a very long time, and where uh, the fora, on, although they manage these conflicts, they do not necessarily address a lot of the fundamental substance. So this would be my sort of caution against um, the islands. And I will end with the last note, is that I think it was Ambassador Fula who said in the morning that we need to have open and inclusive dialogue. Absolutely 100% agree. Uh, and again, I would say the big question, though, is how to bring real substance into this dialogue, how not to have silences over the most difficult issues, how not to avoid the most difficult issues and have a dialogue which will be inclusive, but will skate around the problems. Thank you. Let's turn to, to the issue. I would like to pick up on what uh, particularly we mentioned on the issue of, of migration, which has indeed turned up at all different levels in, in political discussion across uh, Europe for the last uh, uh, several years now. Uh, I would have to add a, a personal comment. I think in my career with the OEC, it was perhaps a bit of a low point being at the Belgrade Ministerial Council, where literally migrants and refugees were passing by on the outside, and still we were not, uh, as, as an organization, able to reflect that in any of the decisions, which showed uh, also the difficulty of, of moving um, sensitive, controversial um, issues from the level of dialogue exchanges uh, to making decision. And here I would like to, to, to draw also on, on your experience from last year as you were chairing the informal working group on, uh, on migration uh, and how uh, your thoughts on the, the, the multi-faceted and multi-stakeholder approach that you outlined before. Um, uh, how, uh, what do you think are the most effective, could be the most effective way, at least in the, in the shorter run, uh, to get from the process part to also a stronger level of political commitment which will indeed be uh, needed to uh, counter message what we see and in terms of the, the, the populist and, and divisive rhetoric that we have seen recently. Okay, I'll try to, to be brief and, and use the example of uh, the German engineering of last year. Um, coming from a total point zero, as you said, and of course our Serbian colleague made tremendous efforts to reach a consensus at, at Belgrade. So they, not at all that they, there wasn't uh, the willingness to do so. It was just not right. But then the German chair engineered together with our Secretary General quite smartly um, a process, and this shows that processes are important in order to isolate issues and then slowly deepen the substance and suddenly, like in chemistry, something crystallized and consensus is possible. So that's the art of diplomacy, it's a profession. And we are not just speakers of our back offices back home. Unfortunately, it's a bit what we, what we are now in the PC. That's why informal settings are much better. 
uh, uh, and so what did the Germans do and our Secretary General and the Italian Foreign Ministry? They engineered a security day, a platform of dialogue with high-level people, well-informed people of the multidimensionality of the problem that addressed us, the ambassadors who were not able to get this, uh, this decision in Belgrade, with more knowledge about what it is. Um, trying to separate root causes of what creates displacement with dealing with the problem as it occurs. And these are two different things. Um, and if you mix root causes into a discussion that looks for solution of the management of a flow that doesn't care about the cause, it's on the flow, then you, you impeach yourself to be active on the flow, and that's where govern governance was lacking. So this was a first informal setting where we in, came in, in depth, um, confronted with the multidimensionality of the problem. And then the German chair, immediately after that, building on this new knowledge, created an informal working group which I had the honor to chair, to chair and leave, left me carte blanche. So no directive coming from Berlin on how to deal with it. And that was quite wise, I would say, because uh, we could be our own engineers learning from our failure and leading towards a midterm result, which was a special PC with a report so it forced us during the spring to delve into these five dimensions I mentioned before. Everybody was more informed. We could discuss, endorse uh, a report. Um, again, this was the report of the chair, so it was not official, so there was no necessity to fight about, uh, 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 about words, which what we usually do when it's formal. But then we could achieve a photography of the issues and of what our organization is able to do in its mandate, complementaire to what other UN and other actors do. So we were well informed and then could translate this into the second part of the year into a ministerial political will that from now on um, governance of large mig uh, migration and refugee flow is part of the comprehensive security issues dealing with the organization. Uh, I will not delve into the negotiation because here also, I mean, we could have had a better result, but we had what we, Mr. Steinmeier wanted, putting the issue on the agenda of the OSCE. So this is, is a bit a long answer just to say that from impossibility and total blockade, we came in the period of 12 months into some results on which I think we should build uh, and we have now a mandate to build on. So nothing is always uh, to be seen uh, only pessimistically. There is always a way out, but you have to empower this way. Uh, and, and you have to believe it. And I think it's, I think it's Mahatma Gandhi who, I say, who said, you have to be the change you are wishing that occurs. So with that, I will end. Thank you a lot. After first, after now having had a, a, a round and heard from the, the let's say the organized youth, engaged youth, um, and from the think tank, academic world, diplomatic, multilateral, let me now return to you with with the parliamentary dimension of how to to deal with. You also touched upon the issue of of uh, 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 the uh, the migration uh, issue in in your first uh, intervention. Parliamentarians as politicians um, should be well connected both with the grassroots, with the constituencies. Many of them are not only uh, represented at national parliaments, but as, as you also at international, uh, whether the European Parliament or um, interparliamentary uh, uh, assemblies. So I'd like to, to, to as a follow-up question to you, 
uh, what do you think parliamentarians or parliamentary mechanisms could do more of uh, in order to, to, to counter this fragmentation and polarization? <clears throat> Thank you very much for, uh, for this question. I want to only uh, to react. Um, I am 30, 37 and I cannot to be in the Czech Republic uh, the president, but I'm very happy for that. Because I think that people after 40 has much more uh, information and much more experience. And this is not about uh, only to be young. And why I uh, to say to you, because uh, I think this is very important, the dialogue between us. Because in, when I was in your age, I had the same vision and the, the same issue as you. And I was very critical to all older politicians, because all older politicians were, were for, for me something as dinosaurs, what were sitting on the chair and there were, were nothing to do. And this is one of your response of your question. This is uh, in a parliamentary world, there are many politicians with many experience, but they are sometimes living in the in the world 20 years ago the example is uh, very well turkey or russia okay i have the same meaning as many many european uh, politicians from uh, my uh, own party from uh, european people's party after russia uh, Russia um, uh, attack to, to uh, Crimea, I am for the sanction. But I am not for to stop the communication with Russia. We need two partners to dialogue. And this is one of part of politics and, uh, and diplomatic, uh, diplomatic influences, how to solve the security in, the, in the Europe or in the world. European Union is sometimes, how to say, uh, very polite, but uh, sometimes unprofessional. We don't take real information. We are using some factors without any uh, context. We are speaking about Brexit and now we are criticizing. We know what was bad, what was good, but we had the, the same information before Brexit. And nobody changed the rhetoric. Nobody changed the rhetoric about, about uh, immigration. Why were in many states in the EU the, uh, growing the populist in, in, uh, from nothing? Because we were so correct and we never said the truth to the people. We spoke about that there were many women and children I was in the flu, I was in the Balkan in these times, I was in Italy. There was only men, sorry for that, but 90% of the people were men, were young men, and we don't respond this question to the auditorium, to the people, to the, to the, uh, to the media. We didn't <laughs> give this information, and this is why the fragmentation of society is so big. And I want to react to social media. Sorry for that, but I am a media person. I come, my background is owner of public relations agency. And I know what is the social bubble. If you are my, my friends on, on my Facebook, and if I like you, your comments, then I have my bubble with your comments. It will be my bubble. If I have in my bubble somebody who will come from, from other countries, from Russia, from, from Turkey, I will have the bubble from this, these opinions. Also, this is about that, that uh, influence of this media we are speaking, this is huge. No, this is only about that, how you want to work with information. And uh, politicians in, uh, in European Parliament sometimes don't work with real information and with real situation. There is 751 members. And when we have, this is about the democracy, when we have some possibility to go and to see a real situation to the, uh, to the uh, Cyprus, to, the, uh, to the Greece, to the Italy, how many people want to go? 
three, four, five members, and it's every time problems to bring some people to this very uh, uh, to these places and to see reality, how the reality is. Everybody is criticizing Turkey. But I was in Turkey many times, and if you see the situation in refugees camps, and if you compare the refugees camps between Turkey and Greece, I think Turkey, this is five-star hotel. I'm sorry for that, but I want to see and I want to compare. And this is sometimes about the politics, because we are comparing with some stigmatize, uh, stigmatizing of the country, but we don't know the reality. I think it's a bit naivety of the politician, of leaders of politicians. And how to change it? I think this is about education. This is ed about education and about this discussion, to speak together. Give me the information. You was there, also give me the information. And we need the real information and not be in bubble of our social media, of our friends, or of bubble in Brussels. Thanks a lot. So I guess also your point is that uh, the previous session talked about the importance of transparency of intention, but it's also about the transparency of information. And, and making that come through. And with that, I'd like to, uh, to open the floor for questions. And as always, I would ask you to identify yourself and, and who you would like to, to post the question to. Uh, uh, I'm the Turkish ambassador to the WC. Thank you uh, f to the panelists. Uh, I have um, uh, three comments, uh, and it might also contribute to the uh, valuable discussions. Uh, first comment uh, is about how we define the we, because we are. This is a session about fragmentation, polarization. I think uh, the member of the European Parliament has give a sense of bringing a sense of ownership. Especially, it is important to the whole OEC region, uh, but it is also. Uh, how we define the we within our societies. And uh, I think we have valuable tools. This is my second point. Uh, we have not talked uh, about uh, the um, erosion of values, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, uh, anti, uh, the growing racism, Christianophobia, Islamophobia. I think we, tolerance and non-discrimination and the work of Odir, the work of ECRI, the work of CER, the work of the European Parliament and all institutions, I think we can bring a better synergy and value. And uh, Claude mentioned identitarism. I think that's the real threat. And uh, in the early 90s, and that's maybe my last point, uh, I was... Uh, uh, in Turkey, writing, speech ri writer of my authorities, we were very much inspired by the Habermasian, uh, Jürgen Habermas, patri uh, constitutional patriotism. And it, I, I think we should um, come back to some valuable intellectual uh, inputs from uh, European elites also, uh, but as we have discussed during the Liechtenstein Institute uh, uh, ex uh, uh, conference, there is not only a vertical uh, mm, problem of trust, vertical trust, uh, people not trusting the institutions, but there is also a problem of horizontal trust. And this has been an example of, of the lack of elite uh, peace dealing or making deal uh, in the case of migration. We have heard, unfortunately, among elites or intellectuals, some uh, examples which might come because there was no uh, social imaginary of the European elites in dealing with a problem uh, of such a degree of migration. So I think the OEC as a platform of dialogue, but more in synergy with all the institutions, can do much better to understand. What is the objective of the structured dialogue? It is having a greater understanding 
and trying to have a common solid basis. Without that, nothing is possible, so we need to listen to each other and to understand whatever we are thinking and try to enhance the we before moving as we think we are advocating for the we or we are thinking that the we we define is a we we think a reality which is maybe not part of the reality and everyone is going separately. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will take, uh, see if there are a few more. Let me see here in the front. Thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, I want to um, respond uh, for uh, last comment from um, Turkey ambassador. Uh, uh, excuse uh, me, could you just introduce yourself? Uh, um, <laughs> sorry. I'm Helena Sjastna. I'm um, here for model OSC um, and I want to only tell you that okay I um, agree with you that uh, we have to uh, see the situation uh, on our eyes but uh, on the other hand there are some factors that we couldn't see only uh, if we will on uh, if we will be here on this place, um, these uh, factors are uh, with that people who are helping uh, with uh, immigrants or uh, uh, or uh, in these uh, places. And um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and uh, my last uh, comment that. Uh, uh, that uh, president uh, votes uh, for that I think <laughs> sorry but I, I don't think that uh, our politicals are dinosaurs but I only think that uh, in the air are uh, negative vibes that uh, many young people are feeling from the political scenes and I want to a little bit change it because I think the political scenes isn't only uh, with negative vibes. I see um, many of uh, plus uh, with uh, European Union like uh, economics, like sh uh, Schengen Sphere or something like that. Um, I think it's only presentive with that fake news we were talking um, yesterday. Uh, and I think that is that problem we are uh, seeing in this world. Thanks. Thank you very much. Then, gentlemen here in front. Go. Charles Ross, European Anti-Corruption Center. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very kindly for your time to come to Prague and explore these issues. I'd like to thank Ambassador Weil, particularly for pointing out a, an issue in the migration problem and the fragmentation long-term problem, which is little addressed. The question is obviously, there are people, there will be people who will be, frankly, invited to stay in Europe. And it is fundamentally critical over the long term that these people are properly brought into communities, to be made to feel welcome, to have homes, to have schools, to have jobs. Part of the problem we see, of course, is the focus on the borders and processing, but ultimately we need to have a better solution set of programs that can address this issue of where are these people going to start their lives anew. As we know from the Interpol Europol study in the beginning of 2017, approximately 90 percent of all of the immigrants, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers are unfortunately passed from criminal organization to criminal organization on their path to Europe. This is one of the great tragedies of our times, and something needs to be done about that, and that's a separate issue. But this problem I have looked at before, since the 1980s, and we are proposing for discussion the creation of a tool, only a tool, of an international migration and refugee settlement network <coughs> to share information between governments, international organizations, 
regional authorities, NGOs, appropriate civic organizations, and faith groups who are all interested, and many of them have historical obligations that they have taken on themselves to help place migration persons, people in migration from all over the world. Some of these groups have spent over 100 years doing this. The concept is actually very simple. We are collecting data about these people, but as I saw when I was at the, at the Atlantic Institute for International Affairs in Paris in 1984, I said sometime in our lifetime there will be a great migration towards Europe because of war, famine, climate change, oppression, and crimes against humanity. Now in 1984, this was beyond the comprehension and imagination of most of the people with whom I spoke. But 33 years later, we are in the midst of these problems. I proposed at the time, but it's much easier to do now, to create such a shared information network. Because ultimately, it is not the 1980s, we're in 2017. There is no one country that can take massive amounts of people into factories, such as Germany did. And we now have the ability to measure business opportunities and needs, hence jobs. We have the ability to collect information about willing owners of properties who are willing to rent to migrants, asylum seekers, the people who will be invited either to stay long term or perhaps permanently. In 1984, I identified that quota systems will not be enough. It will not be enough simply to have targets, but we must be proactive. Well, hopefully it's a little easier to do this now. And with the advent of these kinds of devices and the technology, we can, for the first time in history, reach down into communities and find business opportunities, hence jobs. We can find housing opportunities of willing owners who are interested and perfectly comfortable with the idea. Now, my father's family came from Central Europe, but I grew up in a country of immigrants. I grew up in Washington, D.C. But I am sensitive to the issue, and I think the time has come as a tool across Europe, America, Australia, and concerned countries to start pooling our information about business opportunities, job opportunities, housing opportunities, and to understand that we will need to provide additional support to local communities for schools and social services. And we must understand that in addition to quotas, in addition to targets, we must actively involve all the concerned organizations. And then, hence, we have something we call the ImresNet proposal, which is a proposal for discussion, a proposal to be expanded and to be developed. Having said that, I'd love to hear your comments, ladies and gentlemen, about supportive programs that you hear coming down the pipeline to deal with this issue about where are these people going to go, the people we will have as neighbors soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would I like to come back on that? Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your, uh, for your uh, three points. What did you say about Turkey? Because this is not uh, only black and white. With Russia, this is not only black and white. With Azerbaijan, with other countries, this is not only black and white. This is to see re really many things. Uh, we, we are many times very critical, and we have many times only critical points. When was the attempted in Istanbul, I was only one of politicians from the European Union who sent, uh, who sent some tweet about that, that there is no difference between Brussels attack, between Paris attack or Istanbul attack. If this same attack in, is in Petrograd or in Moscow, I will be on the same line because this is about our security. These attacks are attacks ag against us, and 
sometimes the Czech Republic, I'm very happy that we are living here. We are five of the most secure country on the world. And I'm really very happy that we are living here. But it can change very quickly. And if we are living near the conflict, and this is what I saw uh, when I was on official visit in, in uh, Ankara and then we were in, uh, in Turkey. There was one of terrorist attacks 100 kilometers um, from our, our hotel or our seats. And I saw the atmosphere in our group. Before everybody criticized Turkey, I said yeah, Erdogan and this situation undemocratic, and it was so much criticism. The group of all us, and after these attacks, they told us, "Oh, uh, we have to be uh, really to know how the situation really in Turkey is, and sometimes it's to take your shoes and uh, see." sometimes your perspective or your views and this is not that i will never fight for democratic value i will criticize you for uh, undemocracy or uh, for some things that are different from our european culture and values but i see that you have another problems and we will see the problems in the compl uh, complexity as a just not far. We have to uh, to try to come to a conclusion, and of course, many of these discussion we will continue over over coffee and and uh, and also in, into the to the next session. I would therefore like to just to invite uh, a panelist, our panelist here, to uh, some uh, very short and brief uh, concluding uh, remarks. If if they do want to to add something, and I may let me give you back the floor if you have uh, additional. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am really very happy that I am living in these times. I have four children and I am a man of history. My grandfather was in concentration camp. He was 16 years old. Also, I know what is it uh, to live here now in this democratic world. And I am very happy uh, for this democratic work. I am very happy for your organization that we are living in these times, that we want to cooperate on the issue of security. And this is for your work, all diplomats, all uh, former ministers, all um, politicians and young people. And we have to do, I was very happy for your intervention, that you want something to change, change it. Why I am in politics now, I was really a success, successful businessman. But if you want something changes, change it. Nobody other change it. If we want to live in democratic world, we have to communicate together. And this is every time better and uh, less expensive as the war. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very briefly and maybe on a, on a positive note. Um, often, Politicians or diplomats, they are architects. They build nice plans, but they are lacking the engineers and the workers to build that plans. And we stop at the plan. So I would just say that today there is a big blueprint existing actually that came out of a consensus at the United Nations last year, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. This is the plan. If this is implemented, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, we have a recipe against fragmentation, against ending of poverty, and against uh, ending of conflict. So we now should transform this piece of architecture into engineering, not reinventing the wheel. We have 17 sustainable development goals and hundred and something targets that go with all these goals. This is agreed. We already have the consensus. Let's find the engineering to implement it and we will address most problems we have discussed today. And the OSCE is built to be a perfect implementing agency in its area for several targets of several of these goals. This is possible. We have the plan. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, just very briefly, we started by looking at the different uh, iterations of fragmentation and the different uh, elements of turmoil uh, that are underway in different parts of Europe and leading to these realignments both inside of each of the actors but also in the international system. And I would like to bring this now to the you know, remark made by the Turkish ambassador and by Professor Ross. Obviously, you have touched your point on uh, mm -hmm. one of the sorest issues, I think, in dif each in a different way. I think that the rethinking that is going on in the European Union and in its different member states about what kind of union it wants to be, uh, about how it can indeed uh, unify it behind its values, how it can uh, work to implement the values at home, but also perhaps in external action. I think this is one of the critical issues. I, you uh, touched the issue of migration. Um, I obviously don't work on that professionally or I haven't sort of studied it so simply from anecdotal experience. I live in Brussels. It is a very divided city. Schools are very divided and very segregated. You have uh, immigrant schools, you have white schools placing kids from Central Europe into this divided uh, sort of uh, system for me was very difficult, you know, because they necessarily weren't welcome in the uh, Belgian schools, but also wouldn't necessarily fit in a school where they would already be a minority yet another time. So this is a huge problem. It is a huge challenge. It goes precisely to the values that you mentioned. I think that there's a lot of debates about how to try and address that. For instance, most recently, the debate of the Canadian uh, experience uh, of uh, basically private sponsorship and accompaniment of migrants, I think that hasn't necessarily started in many places in Europe, but is one of the things that, for me, uh, is a very hopeful avenue. But I would like to say that until and unless uh, Europe comes to terms with this and can re-own and reclaim and again uh, confidently project its values, I think it will fall short of fulfilling expectations of countries like Georgia and Ukraine who have put a lot of hope into an alignment with Europe. And I, I do believe that good processes are underway, but they obviously aren't challenged. Yeah. Dan? Thank you. Yes, uh, I can only echo the um, kind of many mentions of uh, the importance of a multi-stakeholder dialogue and engagement. Uh, and one way to achieve that is also to um, kind of in targeted way invest in civil society organizations. Civil society organizations are getting less and less space to make a political uh, influence. Are getting less and less funds, and this is especially the case for youth organizations. Uh, so I can also uh, finish the story that I, that I started before. I said that in the European Youth Forum we had a conflict between the National Youth Council of Russia and the uh, Youth and Student LGBTQ Organization of Europe. Uh, so what happened then is that because of the dialogue, because there was a platform like the European Youth Forum where we could con facilitate conversation, where we can exchange the views, after kind of three days of negotiations, these two groups, LGBTQ Europeans and uh, young, Russian, uh, young, young Russian people, came together and they jointly condemned the human rights abuse of gay and bi men in Chechen Republic of the Russian Federation. Uh, so this is an example of what civil society organization can do and then we hope to also see that also happening on intergovernmental level. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, all of you. Then it's only for me to, to conclude this uh, session. I, hope I, uh, I believe it has brought some additional perspectives from our, our panelists here to the discussion and I'm particularly pleased that after a, a, a long, already quite long day and, uh, and uh, yesterday evening as well with the, with the session, with the focus on the protractedness of so many crises, I think as, as Claude here said, there's also always the reason to be optimistic, to build on the, the uh, innovative approaches from, from the young, uh, uh, better utilize the expertise that we, we have at some different many levels, working together at, at many different levels, and again, turning, uh, uh, turning the, 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 uh, the interest into a drive from change and actually actively pushing that forward. So that, thank you very much, and a round of applause for, for the panelists. Please.